tonight to share with us on emotional wounds. Thank you so much. Welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Lawrence. And good evening to all. And it's good to be here tonight. And I think this might be one of the, the few, um, the few uh, time I'm, this, I'm on this platform and I'm known by so many people. Um, it's good to be here and to come and share with you what I believe um, the Lord has helped me over the years to work on and develop and to, to hopefully offer some insight and some clarity and some help to you. So just some housekeeping that I want you to know is that I do not read the chat. I don't see the chat. That's too distracting for a dyslexic person like me. So I don't even open it when I'm presenting. But if you have any comments or have a question, you want to put it in the chat, then feel free to do that. Um, we have um, Maria or Reverend Lawrence monitoring the chat will get my attention when a question needs to be asked or comment needs to be made. But if you prefer to speak, then um, again, raise your hand and they will see it, they'll let me know and they'll interrupt me. So um, I'm not bothered at being interrupted. So feel free to interrupt if you have a question. If you have a comment, I want to engage you in the conversation that we're gonna have. Um, so last night, um, Pastor Douglas Gibson kind of laid the foundation of, of what God's ideal is for marriage. But as we listen to that presentation, one of the things that I'm sure was going through a lot of our minds, even my own mind is, but so many times we fall short in trying to, to, to live that out, you know, and, and uh, Reverend George gave us, you know, shared about how God, you know, helped him to see it's about him and not about his wife and, and, and begin to change. I, I, um, I wanna talk about what gets in the way for us being able to live out God's design for us. Um, while this um, platform is God's anatomy for marriage, we are very aware when we took this assignment that we'll be speaking to married people, we'll be speaking to single people, we'll be speaking to, to leaders. So um, what we share here, um, it's not just for couples and the next two nights, I'm gonna challenge you, it's, it's for you as an individual, whether you, uh, you're single, you're married, uh, it's about and you will see it in your leadership, how you deal with the people that you lead. So it's across the board, um, but the, the, the platform has got an anatomy for marriage, but we are aware and we will speak in terms of addressing um, married and single as well, okay? So feel free to, to ask your questions, but I wanna talk uh, tonight. Let me bring up my screen here. Um, okay. I want to talk about um, emotional wounds. Uh, let me open this up here. All right, can we all see my screen and can you all hear me loud and clear? Just someone just acknowledge that that's true. We can hear you, Rev. Okay, and thank you, Maria. All right, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So I um, I am working on this theologically and I haven't. Uh, you know, come to some, finally written something out, and I usually um, talk talk to a lot of people to try to get some clarity. But um, the more I have studied this topic, and especially since being on this platform, is the more I've become aware that the fundamental consequence of the fall is emotional wounds, and um, I, I say that, and, I, and then I go back to Genesis chapter three, and I want to show you uh, why I am saying this, and, and you, could, you could look at this more deeply in your own time and study and stuff, but when, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and, and they ate from the fruit together, and um, in verse seven, I'm reading from a New Living Translation, verse seven of Genesis chapter three said, and that moment their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Shame is an emotion. And obviously the, the, the consequence of, 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 of the fall was that shame entered into the picture. Then lower down, when you go down to um, 
to verse 10, you know, verse 9 says, Then the Lord called out to Adam, Where are you? And in verse 10, he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid. Another emotion. These were not emotions experienced before the fall. These were emotions that came because of the fall. And as we try to, to wrestle with this topic tonight, I am convinced that, that what pushes and, and the continued wrestle we have in, in, in even trying to live our lives for Christ and to be good followers of Christ uh, is the emotional wounds that we carry. And for a lot of us, we're not even aware of the emotional wounds we carry or we try to bury it or deny it. Um, I, I do want to say that emotions, emotions were designed by God to have value and purpose. They are not just accidental outcome of being human. God designed us to experience emotions. Emotions are neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. Uh, it's, it's what we do with them that turns that, you know, into uh, bad things. But emotions are there to tell us something. Emotions, God gave us emotions as, as, um, as little speakers to say something is wrong here. If you're grieving, something is wrong. It's a loss. If you're angry, what is making you angry? So God designed that as, as ways of getting our attention as to what's, what's, what's happening. Remember Paul says, be angry and sin not? Well, the challenge is sin, uh, anger turns into sin when it's driven by emotions. But if, if, if anger remains irrational, uh, issue and, it, and you can control your emotion, anger does not end up into sin. So we're going to explore some of that tonight, but I just want to say, think about your emotions. And right now, as you're hearing my voice, you're experiencing some emotions, uh, you know, you're, um, you're, you're feeling some things and you're, you're reacting to something and all that is emotional things you're experiencing. Uh, I believe there is no non-emotional action. I believe everything we do has an emotional uh, background to it. Even when we say, I don't feel anything, there is a fundamental attempt to deny what we're feeling so strongly that we, we, we say we don't feel anything. So let's look at what this, this a little more deeply, and I want to give you a chance to engage in a conversation. But let me just stop here right now and say, even as I introduce the concept that the fundamental consequence of the fall is emotional brokenness, emotional wounds, because those are the two things that come up right away as we see the as we see that. And as we go through this presentation, I want to elaborate more on that. Okay. Warning sign. This presentation may cause uncomfortable feelings, which you're probably already beginning to have, might result in anger, depression, confusion, joy, a hard moment. You might say, Oh, the light just came on or you may feel guilty, or you may get withdrawn. All of these are possibilities, but um, I want you to sit with what you're feeling. Don't try to distract yourself or push yourself away from it. That's what we tend to do. When the feeling of discomfort come along, we try to get rid of it. We turn on music or we try to talk to somebody. When we go to people as pastors and leaders and they're in a painful place, we want to quote scripture first. We want to get them out of it. We want to make them feel good or say, don't feel that or don't feel this way. And what we're actually doing, we're actually taking them away from what God has designed them, designed in them and in all of us to be a means of signaling to us what's wrong and how we need to deal with it. We have a tendency to move away from it because we don't want to have to deal with it. So as we go through this, I, I hope you will see a little more clearly what I'm talking about. Those of you who have ever seen my presentations, this is a, a slide that always comes with what I present because I think fundamentally this is, is, is important. Understanding who we are. We are basically of three parts. We are of nature. We were born in a certain way. God designed us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Male, female, tall, short, you know, um, different races, different eye colors and how we were made by God. That's nature. We come into the world as God designed us. But as we come into the world, innocent and how God designed us, we are nurtured. That's how we are raised. And some of us, all of us, 
you know, have different experiences of how we were raised and the baggage we carry and the, and, and the joy we carry and the, the memories we carry, but we were shaped. And those early experiences, even as, as far as in the womb, we are beginning to pick up some of the emotions that is happening. You know, if, if a mother is, is, is afraid of emotional abuse or she's been emotionally abused or she's been physically abused or, or um, being made to feel very uh, unhappy and sad and afraid during a pregnancy, that child will be born with already having some emotional wounds that was transmitted through the mother's experience. And the third place then is who we choose to become. I wanna make this point very clearly and I, I hope that you will stay with me with this point here. Regardless of what our nurturing was, how we were raised, what we've been through, ultimately what we become becomes our choice. We can't blame that on anyone. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us when we stand before God, we have to give an account for the life we live. We have to choose then for that life. We can choose uh, to carry on blaming people you know, and saying, I am this way because of what was done to me and not take responsibility. And we know a lot of people like that, or we could say, you know what? And this is my journey. This is what I had to do. I had to recognize I, I, was, I was raised in a, in a rough situation. I had some, uh, some bad experiences and I had to at some point stop blaming my life choices on those experiences and take responsibility for me. So regardless of where the journey has taken us, ultimately the decision remains with us. We choose how our life will go by whether we're gonna walk obediently or we're going to look for somebody to blame and not take responsibility. We are responsible. Okay, any questions so far, comments, observation for what you have heard so far? Rev, there are no questions in the chat or hands raised, so you may proceed. Thank you, Maria. Okay. So the Bible does speak to the, you know, helping us, uh, God trying to, um, to draw attention to the need for being healed from the wound that was an, uh, as a result of, of sin, uh, you know, the shame, the, the, the nakedness, the fear. Um, he says, for I will restore, uh, I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal, okay? Those wounds that, that, that you're referring to, not physical wounds, but the wounds that we carry, okay? Um, also uh, in, in Psalm 34, 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted, emotional wounds again. The Lord saves the crushed in spirit, the emotional wounds again, emotional brokenness. God has, is saying to us in his word, he offers healing for these wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. God promised to us is that this emotional wounding, this emotional brokenness as a result of sin, he brings healing for that. And that's what we do as leaders. That's what we preach about. That's what we teach about. So let's talk about what is a, 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 an emotional wound, okay? An emotional wound is a negative experience or set of experiences that cause pain or deep emotional and, and psychological level that often involves someone close, a family member, loved one, mentor, friend, or trusted individual. So this is where I want to caution you. It may bring back some memories for you. You may begin to have some, you know, some feelings towards some conversation, but think about it. You have experienced some wounding in your growing up, okay? Some trauma uh, because of what have happened. Someone, you know, at a tender age yelled at you and told you you're stupid or shut up or, you know, or you're, um, and I will show you some different forms of abuse we experience that leaves most emotional wounds. But it happened to people closest to us because if a stranger passes by and calls you, you know, a name or, or treat you badly, you don't take it that personally, but someone that you trust close to you and they do that to you, 
that leave deep emotional wounds, okay? Uh, emotional wounds are a set of human experiences that cause pain and anguish on a deep psychological level. These types of wounds often involve a lasting hurt caused by friend, family, colleagues. Some of us could think, you know, things like I would not trust again, or I will not do this again, because you were, you were emotionally wounded by someone. You become afraid, um, you become protective, and you, you start to, to take action, to even live in ways God didn't decide de design you to live. God designed you to live in community and to live in harmony, but because of your wounds, you're, you're being overprotective, you are going to set some, some walls up that's going to make it difficult you know, uh, for us to, to live the way God designed us, designed us to live. So emotional wounds may develop from a single traumatic event. You might recall something traumatic happening to you, okay? Uh, a, a beating as a child or a sexual uh, advancement towards you as a child that was traumatic or um, being made to be so afraid of the dark or something that it left that, you know, that trauma in you of that experience. When you, you know, as that, child at young age when you should be protected and kept safe by the adults that you that have responsibility for you they left you vulnerable and you experience some trauma or it can be it come about from repeated episodes of trauma like a series of humiliation where you always laughed at or you always told to shut up i was talking to someone today and you know and she was telling me her emotional wound uh, one of her emotional wounds is that she was always told you're too loud, be quiet, shut up, you know? And so she carried that pain of always being told to shut up. And now as an adult, you know, we're talking about, and she's so conscious of that, you know, that even when she's around people, she's aware uh, of, of, of it. She feels that dis-ease of being too talkative because she was told that regularly as a little girl, okay? Emotional pain then can be experienced in the form of guilt, Shame, embarrassment, hatred, jealousy, anger, frustration. We can go on and on, fear. Um, but think of these are all emotional experiences we have, okay? And if we are going to be able to find a healing from these wounds, we have to do the work to, to face these wounds and, and, and experience the healing. Most of the time, then emotional pain comes with triggers. One of the best ways to see what kind of emotional pain you might have is to check what emotions comes up when something's triggered in you, when something. So I wanna make an observation here and, and this, 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 because it talks about what triggers in you. I wanna say to you, I wanna propose to you that your behavior your response, whether it's to your spouse or church member or as a leader, uh, however you find yourself, I want to propose that what your behavior has nothing to do with the person's behavior outside of you. Your behavior in every circumstance has to do with what's going on inside of you. It's never the external circumstance, okay? It's, it's inside you. Something is a trigger only because you have some pain in regard to that particular thing. So it becomes a trigger. While for someone else, that same behavior doesn't have that effect. So ultimately, your behavior is not about what's happening outside. It's always what's taking place inside of you. So here's the challenge. The challenge is when you get angry or with your spouse or a church member or somebody, or you find someone very difficult to deal with. And they, you know, you, we say they're stubborn and they're hard headed and we say all these things. I want to challenge you to stop and, and just sit quietly and say, what's going on inside of me? What is it about me that is making me have these feelings and make these comments and think this way towards this individual? You will be surprised that there will be an answer in there that will help you to walk past that challenge of that most difficult person, rather than you just saying they're difficult. But it's always what's going on inside of us, okay? Any comment on that?
any any observation on that comment I just made. It's always what's going on inside of you. Okay. So I want to, 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 to share this with you talk about emotions in the brain. So when we receive some information, whether we see it, we smell it, we taste it, we hear it, we feel it, however it comes about, that information immediately registered in three parts of our brain, instantly. It registers in the frontal cortex, where we, where we make decisions, where we process thoughts, where we could be logical and we could be calm and could be in control, okay? Um, the second place it registers is in the amygdala at the base of the brain where we process all our emotions. The challenge here is once we receive that information, the amygdala responds five times faster than the ability of your brain to process it logically. So, you know, you know, we end up saying, you know, you feel, you know, you're feeling bad for having said that, or you shouldn't have done that. Or if you talk to most, um, that the people you meet that have made poor choices or you meet people who have committed murder and in prison, this is what happened. Something happened. And rather than having the ability to process the thought, the emotion, they had an emotional hijack and they reacted out of the emotions and caused some great harm. So, because it's a natural thing, we have a five times faster reaction from our emotions than our ability to be rational. And the third place it goes is the hippocampus. That's the back of the brain where every memory is stored. It processes your memory. Everything you ever experience in life is captured in the hippocampus. And, and then look at what happens here. The hippocampus responds 10 times faster than the ability to process the information you just received. So usually the first reaction you and I have when, some, when we get some information is an emotional memory reaction we are often sh slow to come to the reality of what's really happening here right now. What is the problem here right now without all of the, 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 the um, being taken, being hijacked by the emotions and the memory? Because for example, someone yells at you. Now you, you, you grew up with a father who yelled and whenever he yelled, you know, that was a beating. So you, you grew up with this fear of hearing someone yell. So you are talking to someone at the beginning, yelling at you. You see what happens? Before you could process and say, wait a minute, this is not my dad. I'm an adult. I don't be afraid of this person raising the voice. I could, I could tell them you could speak to me, but you don't need to raise your voice. If you raise your voice, I'm not going to have this conversation. That's, that's a rational response. But what happened generally is all of the fear comes up and all of the memory comes back. And suddenly you are in this state where you are afraid. You don't even want to talk. You just get quiet because it's the emotions and the memory has taken over your, your decision rather than the ability to rationally process. So the thing we work with all the time is our rational process is much slower, but which is what we need than uh, our emotion and our memory process. So that's how we take in information. And, and that's important for us to understand when we're dealing with things. Sometimes you need to take a walk, you need to talk to somebody, you need to do something. You now have to let that experience calm down so you can be rational, come back and talk about it. You know, and we have, we have this happen where it's, um, you have a, a board member and they won't talk about it now and they're raising their voice and, and you need space to just calm down and process this before you could engage this conversation. And if you're not aware of that, you're gonna engage in it in a way that turns out to be unhealthy for both of you. Okay, I'll keep going unless there is a, a, an interruption by something in the chat or is, uh, someone raises their hand. Okay, Maria, I'll just keep going. So to understand the emotional wounds we carry, there are two types of boundaries over which abuse occurs. There's the invasion boundaries that is too loose. We grew up in the family, everything goes, you know, um, emotional, physical, sexual, spiritual boundaries, everything across there is not, everybody just do what they want. You know, just, there was no sense of control and, and responsibility and, and, and um, 
lack of protection for you know for children you know and 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 um i remember you know the, the home i grew up in you know little little kids you know we would be given alcohol to drink and they'll laugh at us you know and um you know laughing at us laughing at our nakedness and calling us names and so there were no boundaries everything was just open and uh, every, everything happened. So in that kind of environment, you will see a lot of sexual abuse takes place as well as an emotional abuse. Then the, there's the, 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 where you are abandoned. So in one place, it is too loose. The other place, it's too rigid. Uh, the family have become so rigid. You know, nobody talks about anything. There is no emotions. There is no nurturing. There is no information for people to thrive. Everything is strict, you know, you don't talk about this, you don't talk about that, you know, um, everybody's to their own selves and you have to figure out your own thing, but you, you know, you, you, you don't get exposure to anything because it's a very tightly uh, a knit thing where you're not allowed to ask questions or to raise concerns or anything. Um, you're not hugged, you're not told that you're loved, you know, all of those things, the things you need to try, you don't get them. So. Those are the two types of boundaries over which abuse takes place. So now I want to show you some forms of abuse that we experience. Okay, there are five types of abuse that leaves emotional wounds. First, there is the sexual abuse. And in the invasion space, touching, penetrating, you know, uh, the, the, the genital, touching the genital area, penetrating, teasing about the body, sexual humor, sexual misinformation, you know, all of those things leave wounds and, fe and fears in the, in the child growing up, you know, um, that will eventually have effect as they get older, we get to carry in those, those, those emotional wounds with them um, in laugh, laughing about their body and, and calling their, their body parts names. And so now, um, now you get married and you're ashamed of your body your spouse have never seen you naked, okay? Because of, of, of the, the, the emotional wounds that you carry in that way, or um, you're not even married, you, you're single, but you don't like your body. You dislike who you are, you dislike um, the, 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 the body that you have because it was so made fun of growing up that you wish, you know, you, you wish your body were different um, because you carry that emotional wound. Or it's rigid, where there is no intimacy model, no closeness, no hugging, no caring, you know, um, lack of appropriate sexual information. You're not told what, you know, not having any conversation about what you're feeling or all of this, you know, um, as you begin to come into life and experience what sex is about, you, you can't, you, you have no knowledge, but you get, the knowledge you're going to get will be, of course, going to come at you. And it's these days of social media, but I'm talking about growing up when it was never talked about, it's never a conversation, then you are also experience some abuse because you lack the capacity to, to, in a healthy way, to deal with sex and sexuality. So sexual abuse of, occurs in these ways, okay? For, for a, lot of, a lot of us on this journey, um, as we try to figure it out. Physical abuse, um, hitting, slapping, pushing, shoving, spanking, you know, I remember, I probably was about five years old, and I could still, I could still see this in my in my mind's eye. I was, we were living in in Tamana at the time. Those of you know, those of you who know where that is, and you know, back in the in the sixties. So it was you know really uh, in the rural part. And my my stepfather was, we were living on an estate, and he was working for the estate people. And you know, he'd come home in the evening, and he would have a, he have a, a piece of a leather strap soaking in in a little bucket of water there, and. and and um, my, he's my stepfather, but he's my sister's father, so she could never do anything wrong. I was always wrong. And I could remember this day he came home and I was a little boy and there's a little drain as you, you cross this little drain to go into the house. And whatever I did, he met me at that point by that drain and I could still see myself rolling around in that drain in that mud while he's beating me with that leather strap. I remember that clearly, not, you know, even now as I think about it. But that physical abuse, of course, carries some major emotional wounds for me in how I responded to any form of physical abuse and, 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 and the fear that was instilled in me because of that experience. And you probably have your own experience of, you remember some of that, okay? And then there's 
rigid physical abuse where you're, you're left alone, inadequate food or clothing, no modeling of appropriate physical self-care. So you're abandoned physically, figure it out. Nobody seems to care about you physically. That's abuse. That's abuse where you could come out of that and you could have such emotional wounds that you become greedy about life. You say to yourself, I will never be in want again. I'll always be rich. I will always have. And you're working hard and you're driving yourself hard and you're saving and you want to have plenty because you're walking with this wound of abandonment physically that is driving your hard working attitude. And you say, I'm a hard worker. You can't stop. You're looking to make money and make money. But deep down inside is that you don't ever want to feel inadequate of having anything. A friend of mine once said to me, I want to be in such a position where I don't want to, I don't want to have to ask where it is. I want to always hear, here it is. That's having everything you want whenever you want it. And then there's the verbal abuse, the yelling, the screaming, the putting down, the name calling, the profanity, the mind rape. Mind rape is when you, and some of you might remember this, when you try to tell someone something that you are experiencing or you are seeing, or, and they'll say, you can't be seeing that. You can't believe that. You know, that's not true. So what, the, you know, to, 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 to be raped is to be, is to be taken, something taken of you by force. So the mind rape is to actually force you to not believe what you're believing the things you are saying, and so you grow up with this sense of you don't trust yourself because if you say it, you want you want fifty people to confirm it now because you have this emotional wound of when you were growing up when you try to express yourself you were always told that can be true you can't do that you can't believe that how could you ever do that and you as, and as an adult you're second guessing yourself as a leader you're people waiting for you to make decision but you're wrestling because you're second guessing yourself and what you're really hearing is the voices that are telling you. You can't do this right. You don't know this. You can't make that move. That's too big for you. How could you ever get that right? So those are some of the results of the verbal abuse. And then there is the, the rigid side of it, of verbal abuse, where no one's listening to you. You're told only to speak when you're spoken to. Try to control your words, telling someone what they can and cannot do. You are, you are controlled verbally. So anything you try to do, you can't. You feel you can't do it because um, nobody listens to you, and they tell you to shut up, and they control you by using words and telling you what every time nothing. So now you come to the place where um, you struggle to do anything because you were always told you can't do it, you can't try it. No, no, no. So you weren't allowed to develop and become creative and to take risk and to be, you know, uh, trusting of yourself and what you can do. So while I put this up here, emotional abuse, um, all, all, all abuse will result in emotional uh, wounds. But I put this up here because what I wanted to make the point is um, people do things to us to leave us, you know, to, to control us. And this is especially true with, um, you, you meet somebody in the, in, in, in the church who they want to do that to the pastor. You know? They want to, and they have this way of, of, of just being so, um, in, in South Africa, one of the things that I tell people you know, in South Africa, it's very, the way to deal with conflict in South Africa is passive aggressive. But it means to be emotionally abusive. You know, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we will do that, whatever. And then but they're not on board, they're not happy. And so they're not going to participate once they leave, but they just give you that impression. And what they're actually doing is, is emotionally registering to you that we're not, we're on board, okay? Emotional abuse also occurs when it's rigid. Um, you know, you feel alone, you don't feel cared for, you feel like you want to allow to express any emotions. And so you're carrying all of this in you. Because again, it's a form of abuse where you're not allowed to express yourself, you know, to, to you, you begin to cry and what you're told, what are you crying for? Do you want something to cry for? And so you shut up and you shut down and uh, you're crying because you're in pain. No one hugs you. No, there's no nurturing, no, nobody caring. 
you know, you, you hurt yourself and they say, get up, you know, uh, that's a little scrape, you'll be fine. But those things are leaving wounds that when you, as an adult, when you try to live, those wounds are, uh, in the background affecting you. And finally, spiritual abuse, and I'll give you a chance to, to talk back to me from what I just said there. Spiritual abuse is this, this in, in terms of the invasion part of it is punitive and angry God. Okay. Um, we are very self-righteous. We're judging everybody. You know, we, you're getting this feeling that you can never do anything right because there's a standard you could, you know, and, and you, 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 you are just constantly made to feel that God is looking at you, you know. Um, sex, you get this very negative message, you know. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't have sex, you know. Sex is bad. and don't, That's all you hear. You hear nothing about, and on this platform, we do a presentation that talks about healthy sexuality, you know, and sexuality and spirituality to try to reorient the people that sex is God designed for us. It's a good thing. But we have made it such a negative thing, I think, to be such, so afraid of, but we get these negative messages in the name of God, you know, and all we hear is how bad it is uh, to, to not do it outside of marriage. Once you get married, nobody talk about it after that, okay? Modeling unhealthy lifestyle, you know, again, um, doing things that are not consistent with being Christian, but still claiming, you know, uh, the, 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 the relationship with God. And so there's all this confusion where you spiritually, you are misled. And, and in the name of adults doing what they want to do, the kids have to see all this confusion. What is really true? Is God really angry at me? Is, you know, uh, mom and dad is so righteous, but, you know, when the home, what happens, the thing we see is different. Or, um, or it's rigid. It's rigid in that there's no modeling of what is healthy spirituality. There is no, you know, um, because God says so is, is, is all you're told. You know, that's it. It's, it's very, very um, strict and you just do it and that's it. Don't ask any questions. Don't, don't raise any questions at all. This is it, and you have no room for conversation whatsoever. So those are, those are five ways in which we encounter abuse that leaves us with emotional wounds that for many of us, we still carry them and we're not even aware that we're carrying them or we're living out of them and we're not even aware that we are, or we are, we are putting it on the people outside of us. The marriage is the way it is because if my husband was better, if my wife was better, you know, or um, this church should be better if better so and so was was less angry, if sister so and so more helpful, or you know. But what I'm challenging you to think is, what part of your leadership, what part of your involvement in relationships that is driven by the emotional wounds that you still carry? Questions, comments, observations. Rev, we have one comment in the chat. Go ahead. It says, you warned us. <laughs> and I see Reverend Alicia's hand up. You may proceed with your question. Hi, good night. Um, good night. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rev. I think even sitting here, I can identify with some of these things. And um, I think for most uh because you know it, it bringing back a lot of memories, as you say, um, yes. it would. It said it yes. would it bring yes. back a lot of memories. And um, but one of the things I'm recognizing is that the person who would have brought this wound or or, or responsible for it um, yes. themselves yes. would be hurt. So yes. it's it's more or less their hurt being uh, you yes. Know, uh, yes yes he's transferred yes. transferred right. to onto the yes. individual who now um, experience this. And so I can see because that saying hurt people hurt others. Yes. Uh, yes. So most of the time, um, you know, they would, they would give us the victim, but mm -hmm. really and truly uh, they become the perpetrator. Yes, yes. Uh, so and, and thank you for sharing. 
Thank you for raising that because, because that helped me to, to say a couple more things here. And I told you at the beginning, I'm, I'm theologically working with this. What I believe is that is the Adamic transmission of sin, is the emotional brokenness we passed on. That we continue to struggle to live righteously and we repeat the sinful behavior. See, And so when I talk about the people that have abused me growing up, I have to forgive them and let that go in order for me to be free. And that's what, you know, Jesus says to forgive your enemies. You ever sat with that for a little while and realized Jesus, Jesus went to the worst relationship you could have. He's an enemy. Someone who wants to destroy you. Someone who wants to see the end of you. Who wants to do you harm. And he says, that's where you start with forgiveness. You know why? It's not for the enemy. It's if you allow yourself to be imprisoned by the action of any person towards you, you will never be free to live as God designed you to live. You'll always be in prison. And so whether a lot of those people who abused me never even acknowledge it. And if I ever say it to them, they will say, I, I was wrong. Or what am I talking about? And you know, all of that. And it was not for them to say sorry or, or I take responsibility or I didn't mean to do it. It's simply for me to be free so I can allow God to work through me and live in me without being imprisoned by the wounds inflicted on me by broken people just like myself that I know if I don't deal with my wounds, I will be um, passing that on to others. And as best as I try, I know I still will because I am still broken. Thank you for that, Alicia. Okay, anybody else? To all forms of abuse is, is emotional wounds. Emotional wounds are the direct consequence of sin. I've said this already which resulted in broken relationship. This is what we're dealing with. You know, think about it. This is why we have this struggle. Well, in our heads, we know what it is we ought to do. We know how we ought to live. We know that the right thing to do as followers of Jesus Christ. But yet still, we're wrestling in this Roman 7 spot where the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Right? It is that, it's the disconnect between what I know in my head in all the knowledge I have of Christ in my head and the transformation in my heart is the emotional wounds that I carry. And as those wounds begin to heal, the connection made, is made, you know, uh, as the wound heal, my heart gets stronger. I get more like Christ. I become more Christ-like because I no longer have to react that way. One of the saddest commentary we can hear is that someone been in the church for 25 years and people are saying, you better watch out for Brother John. You know, he has a temper. You have to know how to approach him, and you have to know how to talk to him. You know, and you have to. We we label people by by the expression of the emotional wounds we see, and we almost like give approval for it when we should be helping people to find healing for that. You want to tell me that the power of Christ can't heal Brother John from being this angry, hot-tempered Christian all these years? Because we have not dealt with the woundedness. We are merely trying to process it in our heads. And we can't make the connection between the broken relationship is the, the emotional wounds that, that, that we carry. So what are the effects of the emotional wounds? Here are some things to think about. The childhood wounds are exposed through adult relationships. And if you do little to confront them, they can ruin your life. Marriages break up. Pastor go from church to church. People, people go church hopping or they stop going to church. All of these things are based in the consequence of sin, the emotional wounds we carry. You know, I can think of some people that, that I met in the church when I came into church in Trinidad. And I could think of the experience with them. And, and now that I'm, I'm here and I have this understanding, Man, I wish I knew then what I know now to say, have a conversation with them, to show them how this behavior is so unlike Christ, but it's, they can't see it because they're thinking they are fine, you know, but it's the emotional wound that is causing them to, to react that way because it's hijacking their amygdala and the memory and they can't rationalize because the pain is so strong, okay? 
people who are loud and aggressive, they are that way to protect themselves. They're not, you know, they're not that way because they think they, you know, you say, you know, I, I, I am outspoken. I say what's on my mind and I tell you, you know, you sit down long enough with that person. I get that person to go deep enough. You realize that behavior is merely their fear of dropping their guard and being vulnerable and what could happen to them. Because maybe when they were a little kid, they were being that way and they got a slap across the face. That creates such a traumatic uh, thing that they unconsciously develop this protection of their vulnerability by being loud and being all of this, but really and truly, it is that fear. Real community can only be built with true vulnerability. We are very superficial. When we walk around and we smile and we say everything is okay and all of that, but we have these wounds that are, that are triggering in us, that are causing us to behave in certain way to certain people and, and like people and don't like people and how we, how we behave. So it is there that creates a problem for us. Okay, hand raise, go ahead. Cause trust, is, cause trust issues and dictate how we will interact with other people. You just think about that for a little while. Think about some of the experiences you've had that have traumatized you, that have caused you pain. And now you use that to kind of how you're going to, how you're going to see the world. You know, if you've, been, if you've been mugged or hijacked in a car as an adult, you know, or someone held you up, it's going to change how you're going to, um, you know, drive your car or buy a gate or whatever. And until you don't walk through that emotional trauma, you could remain forever, always hypervigilant when you don't need to be, see? So it will change you. When you experience it as a little child or as an adult, the emotional trauma will create such wounds and damage your, your, your life if you don't experience the healing. Some people get stuck in places in their life because they, 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 they just wouldn't go, uh, have the, the help to go deep to find the healing in, 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 in the emotional wounds that they're carrying. This is what Father Richard Ross says in his book, uh, Breathing Underwater. He says, religion, talking about you know, Christianity in general, he says, for, uh, for a lot of Christians, their religion has never touched them or healed them at the unconscious level where all their real motivation, hurts, unforgiveness, anger, wounds, and illusions are stored, hiding, and often fully operative. And what he's saying is for a lot of us, our Christianity is in our heads but our hearts are not being transformed. We still living with those. Um, we still can't forgive uh, this person because the wound is so deep. We still, uh, you know, struggle to relate well with, with men because of what happened or with women or with an older person or you know, all of these triggers that causes us to react because of the, um, the experience that, that, that we have had. Um, Christians are usually sincere and well-intentioned people until you get to any of the real issues of ego, control, power, money, pleasure, security, and they tend to be pretty much like everybody else. And, and the point he's making is, um, if we don't deal with those places in our lives that cause us to be, um, we need to be in control because you know um, this is how we were, um, we were brought up. If you want something done, you got to do it just if you want something done properly you got to do it yourself so you got to control everything and you realize you've been driven by this fear of if you don't do it it's going to fall apart you know um all of those areas um when we become driven by those areas we are driven by emotional wounds so one writer puts it this way until you heal the wounds of your past and you are you are going to bleed you can bandage the bleeding with food with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with work, with cigarettes, but eventually it will ooze through and stay in your life. Eventually the wounds will show up. The wounds will be there, you know? And, um, and so we have to deal with those brokenness. I had to deal with my brokenness. Um, I couldn't, you know, I could try to hide it. I could try to, you know, the wounds of the past and say, I'm okay and I'm fine. And, and um, know all the Bible and quote all the Bible and everything else. And you know, most of you on this platform knows my journey, but until I came to, to the realization of, of, of 
recognizing my, my, my wounds, I was only, as the saying goes, I was only rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I was paying attention to the wrong thing. Actually, I need to figure out where the hole was that the ship was going down, not just trying to rearrange the chairs. So how, does, how do these wounds affect us? If you don't heal what hurt you, you will bleed on people who didn't cut you. I just like that. Um, if you don't deal with your, um, your fear of um, your, your, your resentment towards authority, you're gonna treat people badly once they show you authority. You're gonna say, I'm, I'm rebellious, I'm rebellious. Because you know, you're driven from the wounds you carry of your um, fear of, of authority. So here is how wounds affects intimacy in relationships. And tomorrow night we'll talk about intimacy. But these are the things, look at these things. Fear, anger, criticizing, comparing, unforgiveness, judgment, name calling, you know, uh, backbiting. Paul used a lot of all of those different words in there. You look at the sins that Paul identify and the emotionally driven behavior. Okay. And these things affect our intimacy and how we interact, whether it's a spouse, whether it's with church members, you know, however we show up, our wounds will, these are the kind of behavior we're gonna see driven by the wounds we carry, okay? So you're probably wondering right then, if I'm telling you all of this, what, what, what do we do in order to try to fix this, to deal with this, okay? Any questions or comments before I go into some um, direction of how we, we, we try to attend to some of these wounds we carry. Questions or comment? Okay, so the first step then is to recognize your emotional wounds. And someone asked a question, I think they wrote the question in there, you know, um, how, how you deal with it. Recognize it. Here's what I suggest to you. You need to sit with your discomfort. Someone gets you angry, you need to sit with that anger. Someone is first, sit with it and turn it inwards. What about me that is, that is, that is responding in this way, okay? Identify it. Emotional wounds can easily be detected by looking at the difficulty you frequently experience in your life, particularly in relationship, okay? Um, you know, the, the Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 10, 10 says, you can't heal a wound if you say it's not there, okay? Um, you have to come to some clarity. I, I use a line that I talk to people um, in, in, in addiction. And, you know, I, I just came back to the States and I went to the to celebrate recovery that um, Christ in the 12-step program. I started my home church here back in 2006. And I've been a very integral part of that. And so I walked in there Tuesday after being in South Africa for two years. And, and the thing that someone said about me that everybody still says about me is I, I, I said this to them, God will not do for you by miracle what you must do by obedience. You have to own the space and recognize the places in your life you need God to heal you. I have this anger problem, Lord. I am angry. Why am I angry? Why am I always so easily angered? You know, and spend time with it and sit with it. Don't just say, Lord, take this anger away from me. You know, um, you need to know why so you can get to the root of it and say, God, now I know this is the root of it. I need healing. I need to forgive why I carry this anger. I was hurt in this church and now I am in this other church and I still am carrying this anger from over there and I treat the people over here with this anger. I need healing here. I need to forgive, I need to let go. You have to identify that they exist in your life. Um, if you don't do that, then you will be struggling because you'll be telling yourself everything is okay, but people are not experiencing you as everything is okay. Or you're hiding, doing things that is trying to cover the, the, the emotional wound, the pain you're feeling when, um, when, you, feel, when you feel the pain, you distract yourself from it. You have to identify that it exists in you. In your, in, in your. Secondly, stop making other people the problem. 
start to look at why so much of your emotional stability is based on how other people treat you. Okay. So, you know, um, Rev was saying earlier, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody say to him, whatever, you know, he, he loved them. But he is saying that his emotional stability is not dependent on anybody but himself. And, and what I'm saying is, is, is exactly that. You can't, here's it. You can't say it's your, somebody else that has to make you happy. Okay. All people do is they create an environment for us. We choose how we're going to respond to that. Our emotional stability has to be our choice. We can't surrender that. And I talked to a lot of couples, you know, and, and the thing I discovered a lot of couples is that, and we were hinting at it last night, is that they got married, both followers of Jesus Christ, they said, Jesus is Lord. And then I'm sitting there talking with them five years, 10 years later, sometimes two years later, and they're angry at each other and their life has changed and they don't like this and they don't like that. And, and now the life in the last five or 10 years has been shaped by the failed expectation of their spouse and not by Jesus Christ as Lord. And all of the fighting and all of the things. So I'm saying, how come you say Jesus is Lord, but in the last five years, you have developed all this resentment and anger and mistrust towards your spouse. So who's been shaping your life? So we have to recognize it's our responsibility. That's the second step. The third thing I want you to keep in mind is imagine yourself having overcome that emotional wound. Imagine yourself not getting as angry as, as, you, know, as you normally would because you have found that pain and you're no longer triggered. And here's what I tell when I work with couple and I have, you know, what I do now, I focus on working with a couple. If I'm just working at one part of the marriage, I usually say, don't worry about your spouse. Focus on you, like Reverend George was saying last night. I said, focus on you. And I said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, as you change, your spouse is gonna to change towards you. And so things that trigger and reopen those behaviors, they no longer do it for you because you have worked on those things that has caused you to, to react in those ways now. And now when your spouse says something, the, the, the expected reaction doesn't come. So now they have to respond to you differently because you have dealt with the pain that triggered that behavior and you can manage the circumstance and don't allow yourself to be overtaken by, by your spouse. Okay, so that's three. And one final step I wanna give you, and this is what um, Reverend Isaac, mentioned very early, you have to practice mindfulness. You have to practice mindfulness. Practicing mindfulness means being self-aware and present in the current moment. If you don't focus on the problem we're talking about here right now, with what you're feeling about it right now, how you're thinking about it right now, if you don't do that, you're eventually gonna just bring in all of the things or you'll be out of the room, you wouldn't be focused, you wouldn't be listening. But when you're present, when you're in the moment, you can control the situation because you're responding to what is happening now. Mindfulness, self-awareness, being in the moment is a thing we don't do well. Because, I mean, I've been talking to you here and, and for a lot of you, you've been thinking about a lot of things. Your mind's been all over the place. And occasionally you could give me your time here, but um, your mind's all over the place. And that's because we can process words a lot faster than we can speak them. So you have to train your mind to slow down and be in the moment if you're going to deal. So when, when, you, when something comes up, you can tell yourself, Okay, I'm dealing with this right now. So it's not triggered and taken out, taken way out of proportion. And you're wondering, what is all this about? What I just said this. Why, why is why are we why are we having this big fight? Because it's not about what you said, it's about what was triggered because of what you said. So the fourth step then in us working to, to be able to overcome our struggle with our um emotional wounds is to start to learn to live in the present. Mindfulness aligns you with the power of now. The wounds of your past will slowly begin to have less control over your emotional state. Healing occurs in the present. 
All right, questions, comments, observations. I know the time has gone, so I will um, give you a chance to ask questions as I as I wrap you up. But I I, I know um, I know from personal experience that, that it's possible to find healing for those things that triggers in your behavior that you don't even like about yourself. And you, you know, you, so you, you talk to yourself negatively. Why are you so stupid? How could you do this again? Like, you know, and, and really what you're trying to need to figure out is how to get to those places. I could find healing so I can be free and live in the moment mindfully. Okay, anything in the chat, Maria, or any questions? We don't have any questions in the chat at this point. However, we do have a hand up. Okay. Pastor Payne, you may proceed. Yes. So you're saying that having given your life to God, yes, and God comes in and sits on the throne of your life, yes. that is just the beginning. It does not yes. solve the problem of your emotional wounds. All right. Yes, the work begins. Right. Yes. Yes. And I could you could you can use progressive sanctification, become more like Christ. But yes, what we know now, then we our center. And you know, Jesus says the Father and I are one. And he wants us to be one with him as he and the Father is one. He wants us to be one with each other as he and the Father is one. So for that to happen, then. Uh, Rev, we have to look at the things in our lives that constantly cause us to, 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 to as Paul said in Corinthians, that the, the separation, the fighting, and usually it's driven by those wounds that we need to find and surrender and heal and ask forgiveness. And the more we experience healing in our lives is the more we become like Christ. All right. So you're saying also that we all probably should sit under psychotherapists? Not necessarily, but pay attention to the discomfort you feel when something is happening and, and say, why, why am I feeling this way? Where is this coming from? What we don't, we don't sit with it long enough. We, we, we are taught not to, not to feel, we live in a world that does everything to, to not allow us to feel negative experiences. Everything in this world is designed to feel good, okay? Even, so even in the church, as soon as we feel something bad, we want to sing a song, we want to do something to make us feel good. And what I'm saying is we need to be able to sit with those things because, because remember I said at the beginning, God gave us emotions as signals to tell us something is going on. And we need to pay attention to it so we can attend to it and, and, and find the, the real issue and find healing from it. Reverend GP. In, in winding this up, then I want to just make a couple of other comments. Avoid holding on to your pain. There is no power gained from being a victim other than to deflect your wounds onto others to appease your suffering. I, I put that there because that has been my journey. I had to come to the realization I, I got to forgive, I got to move on, I want to heal, I want to be the best that God wants me to be not to be a reflection of the, of, of the abuse that I grew up in and experienced even as a child or as an, even as an adult. So more often than not then, unresolved emotional traumas will eventually take a toll on our physical health and how we see ourselves and how we relate to others. You have to get the help you need. We owe it to ourselves to attend to our emotional health we deserve to live life without being burdened by wounds of the past. To put it simply, when emotional wounds are left unhealed, they can and will affect every aspect of your life. Your physical, your emotional, your mental, your spiritual. It affects your marriage. It affects your relating with people on your, on your board, everything. It will wreak re re havoc. So in closing, this is my final slide before I give you something to do. Emotional healing 
is a process of strengthening our relationship with ourselves and becoming more loving and supportive in all areas of life with ourselves and with others. Others is reconnecting that relationship with God. So as we go, I'll give you assignment. I'll give you an assignment. I want you to spend some time today, uh, tonight, tomorrow, whenever, before we meet tomorrow, sharing with each other an emotional wound you either already knew you had, but never shared with your spouse or someone if you're single and on a platform, a close friend, somebody, or you discovered during this presentation tonight, something came up or something you already had. Take the chance, be vulnerable and share that. Also share how that wound has affected your intimacy towards your spouse or even your intimacy towards um, relating with other people. Okay, how it keeps you shut away or building walls because of that wound. And then take some time to pray together and asking God to bring healing to those wounds that you will be discovering. Okay. All right. Any comment or closing thing? I am true. That's my last slide, my assignment for you. I knew we went a little long, but I expected that because this, of course, is a, um, a, 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 a challenging uh, presentation. Oh, gracious. Oh, gracious heavenly father. We are very thankful that you have blessed us with life and sufficient health that we could be meeting this evening. Many have begun the day with us, but unfortunately, they are not around this evening. It is not because we are better than they are or they were, but because you have lent us mercy once more and we are very thankful. We thank you for all the members of the team that made themselves available to unravel truths in the way that they have done. In many ways, they have opened our imagination and they have led us into sound discussion. Lord, we pray that what we have gained, what we have learned and what we have gained, we will commit them not only to memory, but commit them to our hearts. We know that this is a very challenging time for all of us who are God's servants. Yes, the enemy will do everything to steal our joy. And if he can, steal the word from our hearts and our mind. Father in heaven, I ask you tonight that thou bless my fellow ministers and their wives or their husband. Allow God that your spirit would direct them so that in all of their ways, they would acknowledge you and that their path would be directed by you. Oh God, there might be some on this platform who might be faced with challenges. Maybe there are those who are faced with circumstances that they are trying to get through. Maybe, Lord, there are those who are stuck, as it were, in one place and are trying to move forward. Maybe there are those who are set upon 
The enemy, oh God, is trying to frustrate them with all kind of devious things. And even people, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask that thou would help them to keep focus, to know that we serve a God who delivers, a God who sets free. Father, you said we should wait upon you. Give us the patience in the name of Jesus Christ so that when we can't see our way, when we are at the, the, the Red Sea in our lives, when it seems as if the, the enemy is going to overtake us, oh God, and it seems like there's no way out, we pray that thou would help us to be still and to remember that you're a God who brought us from where we were and you are not going to allow us, O oh God, to perish where we stand. Father in heaven, bless my fellow ministers. Bless their wives, husbands. Bless their family, O oh God. Provide all that is necessary for their well-being in, in a total way, Heavenly Father. Be with them. Under Lord, we pray that thou wouldst be their support in everything. And God, I just ask you tonight, that thou wouldst keep them from the wicked one. For certainly he is like a roaring lion. And if he gets the chance, he will do whatever he can to devour us. And if he devours us, he will feel that he will have the congregation that we are called to serve. He will feel that he has them. In the name of Jesus, grant that we would keep our focus, that will remain true to you, that will be sincere in whatever we do and remember where you have brought us from and where you are taking us. Hear my prayer on their behalf, and even as I pray for myself, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we continue to just rejoice in you tonight. We thank you for life, and we thank you for life more abundantly. Thank you, Lord, for being our rock, our shelter, our bridge over troubled waters, our comforter, our strong tower, our friend. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity that you've given to us tonight to reflect on such a very important topic. Thank you for the one who has delivered, who has imparted, who has shared, opened up. And Lord, not that what was said to us tonight was entirely new, but once again, Lord, you have spoken to us, your servants, in a very direct way. And we just want to bless you for your servant, Reverend Errol Harim, for making himself available. And we pray, God, that what he has shared with us tonight will certainly not fall on deaf ears. But, Lord, we will seek to put in practice. Forgive us tonight, Lord, that we sometimes forget that you are intimate with all our ways. And that even in our moments of weakness, Lord, help us to realize and to be assured that in you we can find strength because your grace you said in your words is sufficient Amen. and so god we thank you that we can experience your strength even in our moments of weakness even lord when 
temptations come our way, Lord. May we not give in, may we not give up, but may we hold to your unchanging hands. Remove every emotional wound tonight, Lord, that may be besetting your servants. We continue, Lord, to interact with people daily. And sometimes, Lord, what is displayed is not exactly what you, Lord, would expect from your servant. May we be true. May we, Lord, look into the mirror and see the person who is exactly looking back at us. And we will be willing, Lord, to just surrender every and any area that would cause, Lord, to become a stumbling block, Lord, even in our ministry. You said, Lord, in your words that a broken and a contrite heart, you will not despise. And Lord, I pray tonight that you will really break up your servants, Lord. I pray for every member on this platform, Lord, every pastor, every spouse, Lord. I pray that you will take full control, Lord. You have called your servants, Lord. You have sanctified them. God, I pray tonight that you will continue, Lord, to just find favor. Favor over the lives. Give wisdom. Give understanding, Lord, as they continue to shepherd the flock that you've given to them. I come against, Lord, any form of discouragement, any form of stress any fear, anything, Lord, that would become a hindrance in our ministry. I call upon you tonight, Lord. You are our El Shaddai, Adonai. God Almighty, thank you that you are our Jehovah, Nisi, our banner. Thank you, Lord, for the covering. Cover your servant tonight, Lord. Give your servants peace continually. Jehovah, Shalom. Cover, cover our families, Lord. Cover our marriages, Lord. Cover, Lord, every area of our ministry. We pray that you'll continue to just open up doors of opportunity, Lord, so that we can walk fully in your blessing and in your goodness. Functionize us, Lord. Functionize us, Lord, so that we will continue to speak under the anointing Thus saith the Lord, may this year, Lord, that we have embarked on be one of the best years yet, despite the challenges, despite the potholes, Lord, the obstacles, despite the rubbles, and everything, Lord, that would come to discourage us. We place everything in your care tonight, Lord. And we pray, God, that we, your servants, will continue to walk in your purpose. Have your own sweet way, Lord, as we continue, Lord, to seek your face continually. We thank you and we praise you and we pray that your will be done in and through our lives. In your son's name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.